In July 2009, a man named Tony Shea sells his business for $1.2 billion. But Tony isn't satisfied. He doesn't just want to build businesses, he wants to build worlds. It's not long before Tony's dream clashes with reality. 911, what's the emergency? Someone's locked in a room with a fire. This is the Cost of Happiness podcast, available now wherever you listen. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. In the search for Kelly Wilson, who's been missing 30 years, we've talked about a lot of potential suspects, teenage boys, a former boss, some rich man, maybe even a hired hit. Well, here's another one, a curveball. It has crossed my mind literally hundreds of times as to whether or not he could be responsible, and I have maybe changed my mind a dozen times. Nearly 15 years ago, February 2008, on a lonely highway in East Texas, a state trooper pulled over a vehicle for an expired registration sticker. When the state trooper walked up to the car, he found three people inside. A 20-year-old woman named Carol, her boyfriend, who was 18, and the driver. His name was James Dixon Graves, Dickie. The state trooper found booze in the car and a fully loaded 22 caliber handgun. When he popped the trunk, there was weird stuff in there. Three fully loaded handguns, four digital cameras, a camcorder, a couple of tripods, like for filming, an electrical sex toy, and porno DVDs. This was Dickie's car, Dickie Graves, a Gilmer native living in the nearby town of Lone Star. Dickie was this schlubby, balding guy in his late 40s with thick glasses and a heavy beard. The young woman in the car with him, Carol, told the state trooper that she, Dickie, and her teenage boyfriend were driving to a motel across the state line in Shreveport, Louisiana, where Dickie was going to film them having sex. The young woman riding with Dickie to Louisiana, Carol, said that Dickie had been paying her to perform sex acts since she was 15. She'd seen him pay other women, including one with severe mental disabilities. Police got a warrant to search Dickie's house. They found all kinds of whips, masks, restraints, sex toys, costumes, and pornography involving very young children, all near children's toys and dolls, and a Cinderella bedspread. In one video, Dickie coaxes the mentally disabled woman into sex by offering to go get Winnie the Pooh. In 2009, Dickie Graves was found guilty of nearly three dozen charges, including possession of child porn and aggravated sexual assault, and indecency with a child. He was sentenced to a whopping 1,440 years in prison. Dickie had an ex-girlfriend. She was a little scared. She thought he was stalking her. He'd be out in the woods at night watching her house. This is Steve Cowan. He was the district attorney who prosecuted Dickie. Steve interviewed the ex-girlfriend outside her house on a sweltering summer day. It was real hot, about 100 degrees. And I'd sat out and talked to her on the front porch. I had asked her the open-ended question, was he ever obsessed with anything or anybody? And she said, no. I left the house, I remember, as clear as a bell, and I went about a hundred yards down the road and stopped. And when I stopped at the stop sign, somebody started beating on my side glass. I rolled my window down and she said, Kelly Wilson, Kelly Wilson. He was obsessed with Kelly Wilson. I think she is the one that told me that he had clippings all over. Seems like it might have been the kitchen, uh, all over the walls. Newspaper clippings about Kelly Wilson, all over the walls of a sex offender's house. I asked Steve about a rumor going around that Dickie Graves had a shrine to Kelly. I don't know about a shrine at his house. He did, he did seem to have some sort of a fascination with that case. 
I don't know if they ever linked him to the case other than uh, just being a, a suspect. He did own a TV and appliance repair place just about two blocks from where the disappearance occurred. When Dickie's family members searched his repair shop near the movie store where Kelly was last seen, they found even more stuff about Kelly. He had apparently the key to the TV repair shop building in Gilmer. And they went into that building and they told me that they found a box of clippings. There was a big box of articles about that Kelly Wilson case there. So he apparently was very interested in it. But Steve also points out that Dickie was the kind of person who just got really fixated on certain topics. Mysteries from the Texas battle for independence, for example, and serial killers such as Ted Bundy and BTK. He might have been the type of guy that would get obsessed about a historic fact or something. So I don't know whether they ever actually linked him directly to it, whether he was a person of of interest. And I did occasionally come across information that I thought might be useful to the Kelly Wilson investigator, and I passed whatever I had on to them. There were a lot of people trying to solve that case, and and, and as you know, I'm sure there's dozens of people thought they had it right and they were wrong. I live in a fact world and not a speculative world and trying to imagine ourselves in the scenario. You know, you're presumed to be innocent and he's not here to defend himself. But I did find him to be smart and methodical and meticulous. He seemed to have a charming, winning personality in A lot of people were taken in by that. Remember, by this time, Dickie was living in the nearby town of Lone Star, not his hometown, Gilmer. When the search warrants were done in Lone Star at his house, some items were seized, including a whole lot of old computer drives and things like that, because I thought it might track back to Kelly Wilson. Like I say, I probably spent a thousand hours on the case in my own time because I, I thought the stakes were high. But there were 500,000 sexual images on this computer. And, you know, we had pictures of people who had been in his house and some of them in compromising positions. And, and I was always curious about, you know, could any of these be Kelly? And so I became familiar with what she looked like and pretty well eliminated her. Apparently, there was no hard evidence linking Dickie Graves back to Kelly. And I wish you well on, on the investigation. I've always feel, been real unsettled about unsolved murder. In earlier episodes, we talked about another guy who was convicted of child porn possession. Joe Henry, the video store manager who was last seen with Kelly. Joe and Dickie's businesses were just around the corner from each other. Dickie repaired TVs, Joe rented movies and repaired VCRs, and I recently confirmed the video store where Joe was the manager rented legal porn out of a space in the back. Did anything you found ever connect with uh, Joe Henry, the Gilmer resident? No. No, and that was a curious thing to me, too. I I thought maybe that might be a one-off. Just to reiterate, nothing found during the search of Dickie's house linked back to Joe. I also asked Joe Henry about Dickie Graves. Did you know Dickie Graves back in the day? Dickie? Oh, that um, uh, name is Dixon. Mm-hmm. His name is Dixon. Yes. Dixon was an older guy. Oh, really? We just knew him when he came in, you know, ran a movie or something. He was kind of, uh, I'm not say crazy, but just a little bit bizarre, a little bit different. That was really all I knew about him. So you didn't know about Dickie being involved in some of that shady stuff back in the day? No, that he was never brought up to me, mm-hmm. you know. But I know, and I, well, now, wait a minute, let me tell you. I think James brought him up one time uh, about, I think he had messed with James' his wife or girlfriend or something. Was that, you know, I mean, that kind of deal. But I don't know, that had nothing to do with anything, basically. He was just talking about that. 
Okay, this is just a weird little Gilmer thing. James is James York Brown, the local cop who was falsely accused of murdering Kelly Wilson in a satanic ritual in the woods outside of town. Dickie always resented James because, well, James stole one of Dickie's girlfriends. And it turns out the girlfriend, her name is Debbie, was with James Brown on the night Kelly disappeared. She provided his alibi. Now that's small town romance. But here's another wrinkle. About a decade before Dickie's arrest and conviction for sex crimes, the police received an anonymous letter. A letter alleging that Kelly Wilson was buried under the house where Dickie lived, back when Kelly vanished from Gilmer in 1992. At the time, Dickie lived just minutes from Kelly's house. His family sold the house in 1996, four years after Kelly's disappearance. Fast forward to the year 2004. Jennifer Dean. Remember her? She was a high school friend of Kelly's. Out of the blue, Jennifer's husband gets a call from the Gilmer police chief. He um, is, is telling him that he's received an anonymous letter and it is saying that possibly Kelly is buried under our current home, which the home was owned by the, that man, Dickie Graves, at the time when she went missing. The anonymous letter sent to the police alleges that Kelly's body would be found underneath her own friend's house, a house owned by Dickie Graves, at the time Kelly was last seen. Of course, Jennifer and her husband authorized the police to search for Kelly. It was time to start digging. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. I know you've been trying to save money. And if you're disorganized, some of us are. 2023 is your year to get it together. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app and it finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Canceling your subscriptions are so easy because they can do it with just the click of a button. You find the subscription you don't want, you press cancel, and it it is done. Rocket Money did it for you. No more hold times or trying to figure it out online. This is amazing. That's why I love it. And for 2023, this is what you need. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash true crime. That's rocketmoney.com slash true crime. Rocketmoney.com slash true crime. This is chapter 10, part two, real evidence. So Jennifer Dean hasn't seen her friend Kelly Wilson in like 15 years. Now she's being told that Kelly might be buried underneath her property. I mean, like they had FBI jackets on. They had tables set up in my, my grandmother-in-law's um, driveway, which just it sits next to our house. And they put on these suits, I guess, to keep from, you know, contaminating some sort of scene. If they found anything, they had cadaver dogs. It was a whole deal. And I'm at home, you know, I've got a couple little kids too. And I'm just like, wow, I can't believe this is actually happening. This is, this is surreal. And they went everywhere. And at the end of the day, you know, um, Chief Grinan told my husband that yeah, that they had, the dogs had maybe hit on a couple places under the house and then another place out at his garage. It was a d detached garage, which he'd kind of turned into like a little workshop. And, um, you know, they'd like to come back with, I don't know what or who, or if they would bring more equipment or what to look a little further. I guess they dug a little under the house. They didn't find anything. Um, they ended up taking up a big, patch of concrete in the backyard in the, outside that little garage and there was nothing there. So it basically nothing turned up. The FBI is here. They're digging up. I mean, are you thinking like, oh my gosh, like Kelly is, is here? I, I just couldn't imagine that if, if that becomes a reality that she's been buried under our house or on our property or something all this time that I just, I, I don't know, I couldn't even take myself there. 
it was it was it's a sweet little home we loved it but that would have really kind of rocked my world because if that's what had happened and it you know revealed some things about what happened to her that would that would definitely be something i'd want but it's crazy not long ago i got my hands on some letters that dickie graves sent from prison to an east texas woman who was interested in kelly's case in the letters Dickie denied ever knowing Kelly Wilson. Like so many potential suspects in this case, Dickie died in 2015, leading to yet another dead end. However, Jennifer says the cadaver dogs alerted on a couple of spots the police decided not to dig up. She has no idea why they avoided those spots, but she still owns the house. Jennifer can't help but wonder what the cops might have missed. She's even been in touch with private investigator Amanda Gamble to see about a new search of the property. Anything to bring Kelly home. Like Kelly's other friends, Jennifer has spent countless hours sifting through the details of the case, weighing the clues, looking for answers. We keep talking about a party. The party Kelly was supposed to go to after she got off work. If there was a party, Jennifer would have known about it, right? But Jennifer is skeptical. What teenagers throw a party on Sunday night? There wouldn't have been anything going on in Gilmer for the most part. So that was kind of weird. There are details from the night that Kelly disappeared that continue to stick with me, that don't have answers. If the party happened at all, something tells me this wasn't a big blowout. I picture a handful of kids passing the time on some back road, a quiet, out-of-the-way place they won't get caught drinking or passing around a joint. And yet, if Kelly was going out at all that night, Wouldn't she have brought along her purse and her bottle of vodka? Those were both found in her car the next morning. I guess someone could have returned the purse to her car later. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, police didn't treat the car like a crime scene. They didn't even bother to collect fingerprints. You also have to remember it was kind of cold that January night and Kelly was in cut-off jean shorts. Wouldn't she have wanted to change into something warmer before heading out? Jennifer also finds it a little strange that Kelly hadn't told her family where she was going. If I didn't come home all night long, my mom would have known. There would have been some major red flags. Compare that to a lot of other kids and that wasn't necessarily normal. So what, you know, that might may point back to, yes, that she was, she was doing some grown up stuff, I guess you could say, who knows, but for the rest of us, that would have kind of, you know, our parents would have been like, yeah, that's not, this is not okay. That brings us back to another theory, that Kelly was mixed up with an older man or men, someone who maybe drove a dark luxury car, someone who'd given Kelly lots of cash. So you hadn't heard anything about her going to the parties with the older men? So that was, I don't know, I guess shocking to hear honestly i don't know so on one hand i'm kind of like wouldn't we know i mean like we were we were partying with kelly and we weren't like judging i mean we were we were all up to no good for the most part just having fun but why wouldn't she tell us but then again if that was actually happening and we didn't know well then there was there was this other side of things that was going on and we didn't know about it I don't know what other girls, though, would have been participating in that if, if none of us were propositioned to participate in it. <laughs> I'm making myself sound terrible, and I really wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? If there were two or three or four girls that were getting paid to have sex with older men, who, <laughs> who else would it be? I don't know. This, too, opens up more questions. What about a random stranger? Some sketchy guy who just happens to drift through Gilmer that night. He sees Kelly. He wants her. He takes her. A lot of people have wondered about this possibility. Here's Sergeant Brown's son, Josh, who was a kid when Kelly disappeared. I've, I've got a theory. I don't know if it holds water. What was a big serial killer that come through uh, East Texas? Josh is referring to Samuel Little, who confessed to killing nearly 100 women between 1975 and 2005. A lot of confessions that turned out to be bogus. 
Little died a couple of years ago. Follow his tracks. He was there about the same time. I'm skeptical that it could have been Samuel Little or any other stranger. I mean, the killer had to have been someone who knew Kelly. Remember, he or they even went to the trouble of returning Kelly's car key to her family, which means that he knew where she lived. And let's go beyond that. What cold-blooded serial killer even takes the risk of returning the key? No, Kelly's abductor would have to be someone who, in a weird way, was still conscientious enough to give the key back. As you can see, everyone save for Lee Harvey Oswald has had something whispered about them over the course of the 30 years since Kelly's disappearance. That's disturbing, but it also shows how this small town still has not let this story go so many years later. For me, still more questions. What about the bank deposit? A random criminal with no ties to Kelly or the video store would have surely kept the money for himself instead of dropping it off at the bank. Did Kelly get a ride to the bank from someone she trusted? I've always thought that it had to be somebody she knew. I just don't see Kelly. She was friendly, but she wasn't stupid. You know, like she wouldn't just get in the car with, I mean, she'd have to be forced into a car, but eight o'clock Sunday night right there on the square, that's a big gamble. That's a, that's a huge gamble. I, and I don't think it was coincidence. Their entire was slashed. I think that that was part of, part of what happened. I don't know about the slash tire. What about her tire getting slashed two nights earlier? And remember, a girl who worked with Kelly at the video store also got her tire slashed the previous night. Private investigator Amanda Gamble has been working a different angle. And Amanda has an announcement. Where are we now with the search for Kelly compared to maybe like when you started this search almost a year ago? We have uncovered um, new um, evidence that has never been released before by um, individuals that didn't talk in the past that are now feeling more comfortable to come forward and talk even since the podcast has started. We don't have just kind of a general location anymore. We actually have more of a specific area and a physical location of where she uh, could possibly be buried. So you think you have this location. I mean, this is, this is huge. This is something that, you know, you had mentioned to me early on, but uh, I was trying to be really careful, not giving away too much. What can you tell us about uh, this location that you have? I won't release the exact area. And you still think there was uh, a group of guys that took Kelly out to some, like a, a pasture and then... I think there's more than one person involved, for sure. I, I don't know about necessarily the pasture. Um, I think that it is going to be a wooded area. And so you're you're still looking at like a few different locations then? Nope. Just one. Here's more from my conversation with private investigator Amanda Gamble. I asked how she can be so sure of the location for Kelly's body. Do you know that because of like confidential informants? How do you know this is the place? Uh, well, one, one would be a confidential informant, and one is uh, since you had started the podcast, we actually had um, an individual come forward that um, was actually blatantly told where the location was by the person that had buried Kelly. And so we've got to, um, you know, really validate that information and so far it, we've been able to validate it well i mean that would be so amazing for for kelly's uh friends and her parents to to finally have have closure and, and know at least know where their daughter is right yes definitely when when this happened you know i was a child just like you are 
and over the years you know this has always been something that has I, I, I hate to use the word haunted but it has it's haunted everybody in in northeast texas and beyond talking with her mother um weekly you know sometimes daily um that is one thing that i know both of her parents want is to know what happened where she's at to be able to have that closure and be able to have a place to lay their daughter's rest i've talked to you and i've talked to uh kelly's friends about these kind of powerful men in gilmer older men um that might have been involved in this do you still think i mean is that the the direction you're going still thinking that it, it involved these kind of older like maybe wealthier more powerful men in gilmer at this time would i be willing to uh put that on the stand you know um in, in front of a jury not completely but do i see that being a significant part in uh the fact that it has not been solved in 30 years yes is there anything more that you you can reveal about that? Not at this time. But all of that information will soon be going to law enforcement. When do you think that you'll have enough information that you, you can come forward with it to law, and give it to, I think you said the FBI, right? I am going to give a lot of that to the FBI. Um, I will. I do plan on talking to Gilmer Police probably within the next few weeks. And then um, I very well may also contact the Texas Rangers. Meanwhile, Amanda is asking for people to speak up if they know anything about Kelly's disappearance. They should come forward. I mean, at this point in time, the way that I, I... Really, what I want to get through to people is that, number one, you don't need to have that fear factor. I I feel like there was so much fear instilled in them 30 years ago. Coming forward with information that you have that is going to be able to give a family closure. Some of the, the, the people that were, you know, higher up then or people that were trying to conceal the truth, they're also dead. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Don't be afraid to come forward with information that can give a family closure. Her mother and her father are both close to 70, if not already in their 70s. They deserve justice for their daughter. Kelly deserves justice. And instead of everyone being so afraid to speak up, don't be afraid. Because you you don't you don't know how many more people have gone through what Kelly went through. You don't know how how many more people are victims. To me, Kelly would want them to come forward. She'd want the truth to be told. What what's done in the dark always comes to light. We don't get to say when the light gets turned on necessarily but it will come out it seems like we're right on the corner right on the edge that's right the wheels of justice turn slow that's something i'm sure a lot of people have heard and and it's the truth i do believe there are some higher ups that probably did have involvement in it or the cover-up of it i mean definitely the cover-up of it but why would they feel the need to cover it up And where are the police in all this? Remember the theft of Kelly's case files from the police station? Was that an inside job? From the details we know, that's certainly plausible. And what about that random guy I met by the railroad tracks, Jared? He said a man from Gilmer got the charges dropped against three guys he'd arrested in exchange for murdering Kelly. I asked my producer to bleep the man's name because Jared seems so unreliable. Also, I want to add that I don't believe his claims about Kelly being on hard drugs. But I'll just say it. Jared named a former cop. There is another story I heard from Amanda. Supposedly, Kelly and two of her friends were cruising around one night, teenagers drinking and driving, when they got pulled over by a law enforcement officer. Kelly's two friends quickly tossed their drinks out the window. When the cop walked up to the girl's car, he didn't knock on the driver's window. He went to Kelly's door. 
She followed him back to the squad car and was gone for a while. Then she came back, her drink still in her hand, laughing because her friends had tossed out their drinks. It was very dark that night, and Amanda says Kelly's friends didn't see the officer who pulled them over, and Kelly never said what she was doing with the cop when he called her back to his squad car. Did the cops pursue these leads? Would they have led to information that solved the case? That's the thing. To me, if they truly wanted to solve it, it had then been solved. There's no way in hell that we have found out all the information that we have found out in the short amount of time. I mean, if you look at it, it's a short amount of time compared to 30 years that we have found out that they have it. But the reason is, is because we're, we're, we constantly are working on it. We constantly are calling. We're, you're, we're trying to find out. They're not. They're sitting on it going, well, it's seen you know, 30 years. To be fair, we really don't know what the cops are doing to find Kelly, if anything, because they never would talk to me. So, Amanda and I have been picking apart the Kelly Wilson case for several months now. There are more details I wish I could share, but I just haven't been able to confirm them yet. I really feel like we could be close, but I also think I should tap the brakes just a little. In my many conversations with Amanda, I've marveled at her ability to dig up information, to get people to open up and reveal secrets they've locked away for decades. But I've also found that Amanda tends to be far more certain than I am about the clues we uncover, and her certainty can pivot to a different scenario, a totally different suspect, in a flash. Was Kelly silenced because she uncovered a drug ring or a porno cabal? Was she the victim of a botched abortion? Who was the older man in the black luxury car? Was there some kind of freak accident? An overdose? We just don't know. For what it's worth, Amanda is convinced that Gilmer police were pursuing the wrong suspects. She believes the guy Kelly had been dating, Chris Denton, and his cousin Brent Ward are innocent in Kelly's disappearance. Also, for what it's worth, I have not seen or heard any concrete evidence linking Kelly's boss, Joe Henry, to the crime. Like his friend Philip Williams said, well, He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Amanda doesn't tell me everything she hears, but even though we seem to be getting closer, so much still feels like conjecture. Remember, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. This is the last episode of Devil Town for now, although I'll continue to follow the case, and I hope I'll be back soon with good news. I can't help but think about all the other interviews I've done, reading old news clips and case files, everything I've learned about Kelly. There are still little details that I'm not sure I'll ever really understand. I do know this. Kelly was coming of age in a world of men, men and boys, who were not often held accountable for the harm they caused. Family, friends, neighbors. So many people would rather blame an imaginary cult or some other conspiracy for crimes that lay at the feet of our own sons or brothers. I named this series Devil Town because I'd always been so interested in how Gilmer got swept up in the satanic panic, how the case of a missing girl was lost amid shocking allegations of cannibalism and sacrificed babies, how, left to run wild, conspiracies and falsehoods can ruin innocent lives. The real evil, as I see it, is that one or more of these men from Gilmer, maybe someone you've seen at church, on the town square, or even the Yamboree in the fall. This man got away with Kelly's murder, and so many in town avert their eyes. In her last photographs, Kelly Day Wilson is forever 17. She's a high school senior who works hard, loves to dance, has so many friends and loved ones. Five years after Kelly was last seen on the town square in Gilmer, Texas, her dad Robbie had her declared legally dead. It was a necessary step to collect a modest life insurance policy. Nobody bothered to tell Kelly's mom, Kathy, until this year. In the eyes of the law, Kelly isn't just missing. She's dead. If she'd lived, she would have been 48 years old. Remember Kelly's friend Michelle? She's the one who moved in with Kelly's family when she had a baby during their junior year in high school. These days, Michelle is left to wonder what life would have been like if Kelly was still here. 
Oh, she would have been a great person. She was just so happy and full of life, you know? I just see her getting married and being extremely happy, extremely successful. She was very smart. I don't remember what she wanted to do for a living. I wish I did, but I don't. And I, I just feel like she would have been highly successful and probably had kids like me. And I don't know, I think our kids probably would have been friends if she still lived around here. I'm still close to a lot of my friends in high school. Um, and our kids have been friends. My kids ended up babysitting their kids because, you know, I started my family so early, but I just feel like she'd be one of us, I guess. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.